Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today, we have back on the show PetroCanada Lubricants, which is an HF Sinclair brand. We have Ron Reiniger. He is a technical advisor, uh, technical services advisor, I should say, at Mining Shovels for PetroCanada Lubricants. And we have Gord Sazinski. He is the senior advisor of tech services mining at PetroCanada Lubricants. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Thanks, Jared. It's great to be back. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to have you back. Ron, I'd like to start with you. Um, can you give us, uh, you've been in the industry a while, so can you just give us a little bit of your story um, coming through the mining world? Uh, yeah, hi, Jared. Uh, it's nice to be here today. Uh, I'm Ron Reniger. I'm a technical service advisor in the mining department for my expertise, which is mining shovel lube systems. And I've been in the mining shovel industry for about 26 years now. And the expertise, like I say, is more the, the lube systems them, themselves. Sorry to jump in. I was just going to, did you start, did you come out of that, uh, out of the lubrication sector for your whole career? Or where did you get your start? Uh, I got my start in uh, pipe fitting and electrical trades. Oh. And then how did you get, what was, what was, the, what was the timeline to then get into this, this side of the business? I was in the right place at the right time when a job offer came about. And uh, being there is a small group of people that do this type of role, um, I was brought on board by a company and uh, basically uh, was taught everything that they knew. And then from then on, uh, my expertise was more from what has been learned as I went along. In the at uh, Gord, I'm not uh, I'm not ignoring you. I'm going. I just want to ask Ron another quick question: Is um, in the industry because that experience you bring? How much of this? Because we've done ep other episodes with Petrocanda lubricants, really getting into the uh, essentially the science behind the systems that you're putting in place for your clients. But how much of it still in this business is? Is that experience, understanding when you're getting on site, what you're looking at, talking to people, how much of that experience do you bring to the actual site when you're when you're dealing with your clients? I would say I bring all of that. <laughs> um, being on, on site with them is I can basically meet in an office and discuss things, but also being out in the field, the hands-on is where you really find out and learn from one another about trying to optimize your systems and and uh, make things right for the customer as well as ourselves to uh, create that non downtime. Right, which is really the end goal. Um, and then, yes. uh, uh, Gord, uh, you know, you've been on before, but I'd I'd like to just just go through your story. You've been in the industry a little while as well, I think. Yeah, I've been with Petro Canada for nine years, but I'm entering my 34th year in the in the lubricants business. Um, I graduated for, in 1989, and I, the program at that time was called Chemical Process Operations and Power Engineering. And at that time, I actually went to work in a laboratory. And similar to Ronnie's story, it was just uh, right place, wrong time. I uh, I was in a laboratory and a guy took holidays and they asked me if I wanted to go work in the Travology Laboratory. And this is back in 1990. And so I went into the lab analyzing uh, lubricants and fuels and coolants. And I guess, as they say, that's where the bug first bit. And I was just fascinated by the lubricants and all the different types and doing the analysis and interpreting results and, and all that kind of thing. And then uh, I was recruited by a large oil company to join their tech services group. And that's where really the focus on mining started. And I've had the, the fortune of working in most of the mines in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Northwest Territories, um, done a little bit of global work. And it's just been fascinating. It's one of those things that um, you develop a passion for and you get so absorbed in it that um, I, I'm truly, I'm lucky that I honestly don't have to force myself to get up to go to work in the morning because I really like what I do. Let's talk about our heavy industry world tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide. 
and Corporate Traveler Canada, helping companies travel the globe simpler, faster, easier. We are heading to events across North America and Australia and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of Crownsman's Heavy Industry World Tour. LNH Industrial can custom engineer and build from the ground up any heavy equipment assembly or machine that you need for your operation. Their worldwide 24-7 field services network is on the job whenever you need heavy equipment troubleshooting, repairs, rebuilds, relocations, or replacements. And thanks to their specialized design and engineering and state-of-the-art manufacturing and repair services, they are a go-to international supplier for improved components and custom assemblies for heavy industrial machinery. Visit LNH. Net to learn more. Xeronox is leading the electrification of off-highway commercial and industrial vehicles. They provide a platform for clean energy technology to get to market through powertrain solutions, development partnerships, and electrification kit solutions for conversions. Reduce carbon emissions without diminishing vehicle performance or being restricted by high costs. Partner with Zero Knox, like many of the world's leading OEMs, as they solve challenges across multiple continents with their cleaner and higher performing technology. Zero Knox solutions are designed and engineered in America with offices in Porterville, California. Learn more at zeronox.com. And you're really, and, and maybe both of you could comment on this, you, we're really at a, it's sort of a new frontier in the mining industry as well, isn't it? Because, you know, the electrification, efficiency, ESG, all these different things that are now coming into play. Um, and, and Gord, we'll start with you. And then Ron, just how much have you seen the industry change in, in those, I think, Gord, you said 34 years? Oh, it's huge. I, I remember the going into the first mine and, and people were putting engine oil and everything, transmissions, hydraulics, it didn't matter. You literally could put a 1540 in just about anything and it would work. In fact, I had my old mentor at the time said we could lubricate that piece of equipment with peanut butter. <laughs> and, you know, it's now the equipment's evolved, the chemistry's evolved. We're losing a lot of expertise in the field where, you know, folks in our area are starting to retire. That's a good news, bad news story. Um, I see, I'm encouraged though, that I see a lot of new engineers that are very, very engaged and willing to learn and not afraid to ask questions of guys like myself and Ron and, and pick our brains. And one of the things that I challenge back to those new engineers when they come in is when I ask them, why do you do it that way? And they say, well, we've always done it that way. Do we really need to change? And, and I go back to them and I say, challenge the status quo. Mm. Because you've been doing it that way for 20 years, that equipment's changed. So is the lubricants that you're putting in it. And, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to revisit what you're continually doing. So I've seen the people evolve, the lubricants evolve, the equipment's evolve. You know, going from diesel to electricity, it's, it's, it's an ever-changing market. And, and I think the future is going to be exciting. Uh, Ron, can you just talk about it specifically? What you've seen in in the shop, like shovels uh, specifically, because uh, I, I imagine that has changed as well. Yes, sure. Um, the, the, like the OEM shovel loop systems manufacturing, it's ever evolving now. Um, things are changing with the new shovels coming out. There's different sizes of uh, lines. Um, equipment, components, how they want to lubricate, but we're still constantly learning and adapting to those to make those settings proper. So what you may have set up on an older shovel, the newer ones now are a little bit different. So you have to always learn and adapt and share with one another, including the OEMs. Mm. And and uh, it this makes it you know ever evolving kind of deal. So, but it's positive. It's positive because they're making things that you know set off alarms and mm. and things like that to to let the customer know or the operators know or whoever it may be, you know, to basically um, this way you can prevent things from happening well ahead. How important is it? It's we don't really talk about. We touch on it, you know, here and there. We talk a lot, a lot about a lot more about like networking and promotion and things like that. But just the community, that sort of shared knowledge. How important is that? Because you know, as as things change, um, there's there's people that bring that knowledge that can provide a base of knowledge that you can build on. 
as opposed to, you know, the approach of let's just reset everything. Well, now where are you starting from? So how important is just that community, keeping in touch with people that you've, you know, from different companies, talking to them, uh, like, like Gord mentioned, you know, talking to new people and get fielding those questions. Ron, for you, how important is it to keep that sort of that sense of community um, so that that knowledge keeps getting shared and the industry improves? Oh, for sure. That is very important. Um, you know, we're getting into the, say, um, older engineers um, to the younger ones. We all have to work together and, and transfer that knowledge. If if we don't transfer that knowledge, yes, that, that can cause problems because uh, the newer ones have to learn and the older ones think, well, that's just the way we do it like Gord had mentioned. And uh, no, we have to keep learning all along. And that's where we're kind of in the middle, um, as well as ourselves learning to to mitigate these, uh, these gaps in the maintenance. And then when we're all on the same page, everything flows smoothly. OptiSize is a leading edge geophysical acquisition design and software company. OptiSize provides innovative seismic survey designs utilizing the latest field technology and optimizing for advanced processing and quantitative interpretation techniques. OptiSize's mission is to bring sustainable exploration solutions to energy development with their custom land footprint reduction technology. EcoSize. EcoSize enables operators to focus on reducing their environmental and greenhouse gas footprint while imaging all their subsurface targets and reducing costs. You can visit them at OptiSize.com to learn more. With Fender Dunlop, you know you are getting the best conveyor belting in the market. That's because they ensure the integrity of their conveyor belting by monitoring each step of the manufacturing process in their North American facilities. Focused attention is given to each belting order to guarantee that they produce a belt that will assist the customer in reducing operation costs, maximizing uptime, and improving revenue. Visit FenderDunlopAmericas.com to learn more. Based in Southern California, Enhanced Scanning has performed thousands of projects on construction sites across the U.S. in an effort to help its customers find the unfindable. Enhanced Scanning combines ground-penetrating radar, laser scanning, and drone inspection services to provide comprehensive deliverables for their customers' fast-paced timelines, all without sacrificing quality or communication. To learn more, you can visit them at EnhancedScanning.com or find them on LinkedIn at Enhanced Scanning. I guess so that, and maybe... Uh either one of you can comment on this the it also becomes so as as people move out and retire companies like petro canada lubricants it becomes even more of a demand uh to put these maintenance uh strategies in place and put the right products in place amongst the fleets so that that knowledge it it's not it doesn't leave with one person right correct yeah yes it is a small world out there so it's absolutely amazing the people that I get to talk to, um, the amount of experience that's <laughs> that's coming out of, of organizations like Petro Canada Lubricants. Can you, Gord, can you give um, just the audience, just for anybody who's missed some of the other episodes, and uh, there is a new audience here now as well, uh, just a snapshot of Petro Canada Lubricants. Absolutely. Petro Canada Lubricants is an HF Sinclair brand. And we specialize in products and services proven to maximize performance, productivity, and overall savings to our mining customers. We have everything from heavy-duty engine oils, hydraulic fluids, automatic transmission fluids, gear oils, drivetrain, greases, and really everything that you might absolutely need to continue mining in your operations. And then, uh, Ron, bringing you in, what is going to be the primary focus of, of today uh, in coming on this show? My primary focus is going to be best practices for mining shovel maintenance, as well as Gordy will be bringing in some of his maintenance best practices. Can you expand a little bit um, just specifically to the shovel maintenance side, um, PetroCanada lubricants, you know, offerings, capability, um, and just outline that for the audience? Okay, in my area, it's always a small group of people that actually do this role that I am in in the industry. Um, it's kind of like a specialty expertise. And I make a lot of friends um, out there in the mining world. It is a small world. And what we learn from one experience, we take to the next issue, all learning from best practices. 
And you know, it's always a small community based it on trust or trusted judgment and technical expertise built over a long career. If that means an insight into financial savings that you can pass on, the people trust your judgment or my judgment in this case. Um, the mining industry is quite small in, in a sense. It's so large. And Petro-Canada Lubricants operates at such a large scale globally for mining. Um, but it, it is also quite small in the sense that you do, like if you go to an event, you see a lot of the same people. It, it's sort of networked in. F for you, um, well, Ron, how long do you say you've been in the industry for? Um, 26 years. How do you build that trust? Um, when, when you're connecting with new people and, and, and communicating the value, communicating the savings, but at the end of the day, there has to be a certain amount of trust in you, the person standing there, talking to them. How do you build that, uh, still to this day in the industry? I think the trust is built on when I make recommendations mm. and, uh, help teach the technicians what to look for at the end of the day, I'm saving the cost savings on their downtime is really great. And I've actually had one customer at one point say, I wouldn't trust anybody else in the world with my grease issues on my shovels than Ron Renniger. Wow. Um, when you, you mentioned best practices. What does that mean? Um, both, and I'm going to ask it as sort of a two-part, from the Petro-Canada lubricant side, what does that mean? And what is that expectation from the client side? The best practices are basically coming with the experience of, of, of adjusting your lube systems and the amounts of the lubricant. In order, it's more like the right amount of the right lubricant at the right place at the right time. And you have to do all those things to get it so that the customer um, at the end of the day, saves money, and then you build the trust with that. So are you setting that plan? You're not just selling the product then. You're actually setting that, you're actually putting that plan in place at their operation. Is that right? I assist them in putting the right. plan in place. You make recommendations. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gord, I want to bring you in on this, uh, and you know it, it's been a while since we've done one of these features. Um, can you give us some updates on what's new, exciting, um, anything coming out that we should know about? You know, we've had some record temperatures over the summer, and getting into winter here, we don't know what we're after. But um, it, we've had some challenging times over the summer. You know, no different than anybody else with supply interruptions and the global supply chain issues. Uh, again, record high temperatures. We've really been taxing the lubricants and their longevity and their ability to operate in some of the equipment. And we've had to work really closely with our mining customers to try and deal with that excessive heat in some of those operations. And, and our focus this past summer has really been on solving issues as they come up and help our customers make the necessary changes to keep the operations running and profitable. Gord, can you just walk us through a mining operation and and really just paint a picture of why selecting these right lubricants within, you know, and sometimes within changing environments is so important. Absolutely. So going back 20 or 25 years ago, lubricant recommendations were a lot easier than they are today. The equipment was a lot easier and very broadly stated, one size could fit all. Mm. And, and it's become more of a specialized kind of a game where you need specific lubricants for specific applications and specific duty cycles in different operations. Um, since then, there's been a lot of change and restrictions on emissions, for example, and there's a new engine uh, category coming down the pike for 2027 that's even gonna tighten that up uh, more broadly. But there's been a focus on fuel economy improvements, capturing greenhouse gas reductions, and that really lends itself to one solution does not fit all anymore. Uh, the sheer range of equipment used in, a, in an active mine, you know, everything from 400 ton haul trucks, shovels, loaders, drills, dozers, cranes, mm. uh, just to name a few, all of which are withstanding excessive loads or are overloaded and a wide range of temperature ranges where we have everything up north from minus 40 to, 
even now in the summertime, plus 40. And this last that summer range. was no exception. Yeah, we, we had really excessive hot temperatures during the summer. And in some of these northern mining locations, it's it's been unseen in history. So when that happens, our job as tech advisors is to help the mine prepare in advance and reassess the products they're using in those operations. And, and we aim to increase the efficiency of the operations. And quite often we'll tweak a product recommendation um, based on the season or the ambient conditions that it's gonna run in. And one of these areas we didn't get to last time was when I was in the hot seat was oh. the world of shovel maintenance. And that's where Ron brings his expertise yeah, um, and, and his opinions. And Ron, I want to bring you in here in a sec. Um, Gord, I just want to just, I, I want to just sort of drive this home though. Can you paint a picture of when it goes wrong? When, when you don't get it right, what are the consequences that you're seeing sort of across the board at a mining operation, especially with this huge range in temperatures? It's happened in a few different places that um, where the wrong product had been put in the wrong application in, in some instances. And what ends up happening is a, mach a machine may prematurely failure or may prematurely see some maintenance issues and where we have to work with a customer and try and react to that situation and get the equipment back in service. So for example, um, if a haul truck were to lose a differential, uh, a differential or wheel motor on its own is, for example, six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. That truck may be making ten to twenty thousand dollars an hour, and if you have a, an unplanned uh, maintenance incident, then you have to take that unit out of service, and the clock starts ticking on all this money in production and equipment replacement. And with the supply chain issues that we saw globally, mm -hmm. um, you can't just order a differential for a haul truck and have it delivered in four or five days. Sometimes it was taking weeks. And in worst case scenario, we saw it happening over months. Yeah. So proactively, we really tried to work with customers and, and watching temperatures and ambient conditions and, and working to alternate or alter some of those recommendations during those hot spells to try and make sure that we didn't have any um, incidents at all. Yeah, that's an interesting point you brought up. It, it, you know, these sort of these things in, in these interviews popped to, popped to my mind, and you just touched one. Is that it is that during things like COVID and then coming out of that, the supply chain issues. I would imagine that then your clients really that. What you've pushed, because we've seen it on other episodes, you're talking about it, um, that importance of getting it right, planning it out properly, that sort of got to a new height, which is sort of an opportunity, really, then, for Petrocandle Lubricants to show what you're capable of at these operations. It really was. And, you know, something that we've been doing for decades, and it's not new, but it's been wrapped up under the umbrella of sustainability, is optimizing or maximizing oil drain intervals consolidating the lubricants. And during COVID and during the supply chain interruptions, there was really a, a, a larger focus on maximizing and optimizing these drain intervals where you can keep units in production longer or prolong the life of the, the lubricant so that they didn't have to bring the equipment in for oil changes as often and get more production out of that maintenance cycle. So there was a bit of a renewed focus. And again, it's something that we've been doing all along, but it really came right. to the forefront during the supply chain interruptions and, and COVID. Yeah. Um, and Ron, I want to bring you on. Can we talk specifically to shovels, um, the importance of the lubrication systems and selecting the right one within the shovels specifically? Yes. Like in my uh, shovel lube system experience, <clears throat> I can say that lubricants, are really about a few guiding principles. And the biggest one, again, is the right amount of the right lubricant to the right place at the right time. So for instance, we're heading into the winter, and as, as we all know, seasonal changes for these mining operations can be particularly challenging to keep the greased lube films and proper purges the way the customer wants to protect components. OGL and grease lubricants have a crucial role to play in protecting these mining shovels. With proper application practices, they're just as important as selecting the right oils, and like on Gord's side. 
and each component requires the right amount of lubricant to perform at optimal level, which can secure extended equipment life and reducing the operating cost. So when something like this would go wrong, like you asked my colleague Gord, I would say when it goes wrong, we have over lubrication and that's an issue mm. that challenges mining shovel reliability and can be attributed to poor communication sometimes between shift changes, lack of reporting or misinterpreting how the product should be applied as, long, as well as your seasonal changes being done in a timely fashion. As with all mining shovels, while it makes sense to think more of a good thing is best, over lubricating can cause premature wear issues mm. because when shovel open gears or dipper sticks are over lubricated, that open gear lube can become runny and drip off, leaving the metals exposed to contact. The result is unexpected maintenance costs and increased downtime and while well, costly repairs could be undertaken. But let me be clear, it's about getting in the field with the customers and the technicians and seeing it firsthand and up and close and educating them as well as myself what we need to do to keep this optimized for the customer. Ron, what are some common um, what are some common issues? You, you, I know you just touched on them, but what do you just if you can go through it again? When you're going on to site, what are you looking for? What are you troubleshooting for when you land on uh, at an operation? And we can go specifically with shovels. Um, basically, some of the troubleshooting that I'm looking for is what are those lube films like? Are they thick, plated, or are they like we just spoke about? runny um what is the timing interval set at what are the injectors or the equipment on the system set at how do we adjust them um, the best thing is always having one of the technicians from the mine site with me so they can understand what i'm looking for and they can relay that back to their crews and their foremans so that we are all on the same page and these issues you know, they can happen on and on again and again. But as we educate each other, it begins to make itself more clear and help get these lube films and purges the way we want them. I'll, I'll go I'll go back into to me as a kid. Like I used to like, you know, forklifts and stuff. I was lubricating stuff and I was just doing it. I was just eyeballing it. I, everything you just said, I probably did wrong. Um, not probably. As you're saying it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did. I was doing that wrong. Um, but are these are, – are some of these systems now – like the lubrication systems, like on, on some of these shovels now, are they automated? Are, are people still manually doing it? How do you – how is that actually taking place in these systems now? Yeah. Yes. They're, they're all automated on these shovels. So there's like computer um, – PLCs involved and uh, not very much manually because it wouldn't be safe to be doing this manually. So yeah, the automation is there, um, which does help when you set them up properly. When you set of them course. up properly, yeah. Yeah, and of course things happen, you know, with the extreme weather, with the, the dust and whatever else you're dealing with. Um, you know, things wear out, they need to be changed, they need to be checked. So it's it's best to keep that system optimized, and again, that helps you with your your optimization of downtime and uptime, right? What are some general tips you have? Again, you sort of touched on them, but just to sort of expand a little bit, if you're if you're just let's say you're at an event, we we go to some of the same events. If if we were at one of those, and someone's just saying, you know, what can we just do better? What do you sort of what are your first go tos um, that people should should just best practices that we touched on earlier? Well, I always try to explain this first. We want that plated, thick lube film on open gears. And the best way that I always explain this is if you were to take a shiny piece of steel with nothing on it, and you have a can of black matte spray paint, and you spray that on that shiny piece of steel, and you wait two minutes or whatever it might be, very quickly you put another coat on there, it runs off. So it makes it very runny. Now, if you wait and wait for the second coat for a certain period of time, then you start to see it just like painting, you put the second coat. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to do with the grease. 
So in order to do those or to get that achievement, um, I think we have to start, first of all, going around the shovel, inspecting. You want to start looking at the timing. You want to see what your injectors are set at. You also want to make sure that all your sprayers, everything is working properly before you make certain uh, adjustments. You can't just make one little adjustment. Mm. You need to go through the system, and, and that's very important, to make sure that all components are working properly and adjusted, then you achieve what your your thickness and your plated loop films. The on the automated systems, how are they how, how is it how is it set up to uh, lubricate? Is it based on is there some sort of system that's based on the need? Like you're saying about that double spray, which again going back, I also sprayed stuff <laughs> I also painted yeah. and did that all the time as well. I must have been a great employee back then. Um, but when is that how is that being de- how is that automated system deciding is it based on the the you understanding the hours that that machine will be in operation um how is that lubrication actually being distributed for the machine yes it's being distributed um by timing so time intervals okay. and those time intervals and amount again at the right time are can be adjusted by overall experience over time Mm-hmm. but also can be calculated for um, certain components that say, I need this much lubricant at a certain interval. So we try to adjust that to what, say, the OEM would come up with, mm-hmm. but then it doesn't always work that way. And that's where I think the experience with myself and customers helping one another, we we can adjust that so that we get those good plated films or purges that we desire. Right, because an OEM might spec the machine for um, you know a certain type of environment, and we're just doing a whole bunch of episodes in Australia, and in the, and in Australia they have such severely different types of environments that the same machine might be operating in. So that would then change the need, right? And, and maybe both of you could touch on that. Correct. Yes, where you know in a warmer climate your time intervals may stay the same all the time. Your particular type of grease or OGL would be the same all the time, where in our northern colder climate sites, it's so extreme that we're adjusting all the time to the to the weather, it's, you know, the, where it gets very cold or very hot in the same year, um, mm. which makes it a little more challenging to try to achieve these these films and purges that we want. Um, and then, Gord, bringing you in on the uh, uh, the the other big topic, and it comes on, up on the show from all different angles now, um, is the mixed fleet discussion, that every machine, you have different environments, um, you have different operators, <laughs> different timing schedules, maintenance, and then you have just different machines, uh, di- different OEMs. On, in the field. How do you approach that? That's a great question. And it has gotten complicated over the years as the equipment technology has improved. And it's varied from one manufacturer to the next. The quality of the lubricants has improved over the last three decades as well. And in a surface mine operation, for example, you have several different OEMs on those mines. And, and it's even more complicated if you have a surface and underground operation, for example. And that's where really a a technical service advisor can really help your operation. Because with a mixed fleet, there's there's a desire from the customer to use the smallest number of lubricants that they can. I mean, warehouse space is a premium. Um, A lot of these larger mines use bulk lubricants, so they have bulk tankage, but they only have a and in, they don't have an infinite amount of tanks. They have a defined number of tanks that they can use. So consolidating, reducing the number of products through a consolidation effort with a tech service advisor, it's something that a lot of the mines try and do. The, the problem you have with that is these mixed fleets. Um, I'm currently working on one right now where a particular mine has three different manufacturers of haul trucks and they utilize four different manufacturers of engines. 
and some of the engines are coming from Europe and some from the United States and mm. and the recommendations are completely different because they're outfitted with um, different variations on exhaust after treatment. So the formula of the lubricant that you're gonna use in those engines is completely different from one model to another. Now, a lot of these customers, they don't have the manpower and then sometimes they don't have the expertise to sit down with several of these OEM manuals and go through several hundred pages of lube recommendations and maintenance considerations to consolidate those lubricants and come up with those recommendations. And that's where as technical advisors, we've done a lot of that legwork where we will work with the OEMs, we work with our research chemists, and we work with the customers and we understand what those recommendations from the OEM are, and we understand what the chemistry is that's gonna go into those recommendations. And we cycle back and we figure out what is the fewest number of lubricants that we can use. And sometimes we get it lucky and we get one oil, we'll do every engine. But in this particular instance, we're not gonna have that luxury. And with underground mines, it even becomes more complicated where the focus is on the equipment emissions. And you'll see there's a lot of electrification going on underground in a lot of that equipment. And that's really a good thing because it's all about workers' safety. But in some of the mines where a lot of that equipment is still um, liquid fuel or diesel fuel fired, the emissions that are being emitted by that equipment are really a, a serious consideration. And one that we have to take seriously when we're making those lubricant recommendations. The other issue that you deal with or don't deal with in an underground mine is, for example, if you're 3,000 or 3,500 feet underground in a potash mine, it's a constant 80 or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't have to deal with the temperature extremes that you do on the surface. So your recommendations become different than they would be on a surface mine, especially if you have both operating in the same um, location. Another one that comes to mind is that the machines themselves change. Do they change as well? Like as in new off the lot, um, you know, the first year of operation versus the third versus the 10th, you know, versus the rebuild. <laughs> um, how does the, the life of the machine, it must change as well. It does. And and we use a term that um, many are familiar with or, or maybe not familiar with is we use a, a we call it a bathtub curve where when a new piece of equipment is commissioned, you have what old school guys will call the break-in period or, mm. you know, new school, it might be the equipment's seating itself. And you pay a little more attention to it when that's running because typically if something's going to go wrong, and let's face it, sometimes things do go wrong. As long as we're dealing with mechanical equipment, things are going to go wrong. Um, it quite often happens as soon as you commission a new piece of equipment, the, the parts don't seat properly or something wasn't installed properly or it wasn't commissioned properly. And you do have those failures. And then at the flat part of the curve, you have what we call like the normal operating life where you do your regular oil change intervals, you do your regular maintenance, your filter drain, your filter changes, things like that, and everything works fine. And then you get to the end of life where you're going to start looking at doing an in-frame overhaul or completely re-overhaul or replace the component and you start to watch that curve slope upwards and the trick is to try and get to that before it actually happens and so doing that in a mixed fleet and you alluded to it earlier jared you have different operators you have different terrain you have different temperature conditions you have different load capacities um, I was actually working with one mining customer that said, you know, the average 400 ton haul truck is actually loaded to 420 tons. Mm. So you're overloading the equipment to start with. But I mean, in production, you try and get what you can out of it. And so when you deal with all these things, we're back to that one size is not going to fit all. And you really do have to look at each piece of equipment as its own individual entity. Ron, I'd like to bring you in on that um, because you mentioned like overhaul, um, like overloading equipment or you, things like overworking or an operator being a little over aggressive with the equipment, all these. Are you able to tell that? Is that, are, are there telltale signs that that sort of thing is happening when you're going out, you're taking what the equipment is and just sort of assessing what they need? 
are those factors are they are they sometimes obvious or is that a pretty hard difficult thing to know um it's difficult to know right away but with my experience sometimes uh that's where it's you have to find out the rest of the story that's where you can't just great deal reference with one paul person. harvey <laughs> sorry i couldn't help that huh? oh no i yeah, said great paul reference harvey. paul harvey yeah <laughs> um yes definitely um and that's what you do you have to find out you have to get everybody's um story on it and then you mm. it's like an investigation and sometimes yes those are the same things that i deal with on shovels too could be an operator maybe running a little bit different than another one um you know uh, the, the machine itself is getting older or it's newer like gord had mentioned um you're i'm dealing with all those kind of things too in in the shovel world i want to ask you both um as we get sort of the, t the tail end of this interview um and it, i'm sure the oh, the answers will overlap but i i just and i but i think different people communicate things differently so what should what should clients expect if you're come when they first start that right from first contact right to actually coming on site you know right through to delivery um and and gord maybe we'll start with you and then ron uh you can fill in some information as well w what should clients expect if they reached out to you today um until delivery when we show up on a customer's site i think the first thing the customer can expect is is a level of expertise and ron said it early on in the interview that we, we gather a lot of best practices. Um, I mentioned I'm going into my 34th year and I've lasted that long because I've been able to sit and listen to the customers mm. and I listen to what the customers tell me. And we just mentioned the, the reference to Paul Harvey and now you know the rest of the story. A lot of what we do is we will ask a lot of questions and then we will listen because we learn a lot that way. And in turn, we can share our experiences and best practices that we've learned. Um, having access to most of the mines in Western Canada that I've been through, I've seen a lot of really, really good practices in terms of maintenance and how to get things done and how to prolong the life of equipment. But on the other side of that coin, I've also seen a lot of things that don't work really well. And I've seen a lot of things where, you know, we should have done this first and not done that or I've seen where customers have made decisions without consulting a, a tech advisor. And really it becomes a, a collaborative effort and that everything we do on site 100% involves the customer. Um, we don't walk onto site and, and sit in a room by ourselves and do a bunch of calculations and things like that. We're constantly walking through the site, we're in the shop, we're talking to the mechanics we're talking to the reliability engineers. Literally, everybody's got a story to tell, and every little bit of that story helps paint a picture for us that something that um, somebody in the shop may think is not very important mm. to us could be pivotal in how we solve that problem. So it really comes down to collaborating with the customer and listening to what's going on. Uh, Ron, anything to add to that? Well, I think Gordy just about covered it. Yeah, that was a pretty good I, answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gord. <laughs> but yeah, in the shovel world, it's the same thing. Um, and I think, as just like Gord said too, with the, our experiences, we bring that to the table um, to help that customer. And yes, there is most of the mines we deal with have really, really good uh, best practices, and we're there to help them to be better practices with our experiences but investigating the issues is very important you have to find out again the whole story that's that's what we do it's not just a one-time guess uh you know over the phone call we'd like to go out see the equipment and then we can make our you know recommendations from there and it's very important that the customer knows that we are there when they need us the most. And I think that's very important that Petro Canada Lubricants offers their tech technical service for. 
Uh, you, you now, now I'm just I'm gonna have to Google or YouTube uh, some some Paul Harvey and just listen to him. It's been a while. Um, every now and then I need to, <laughs> to hear that great voice. Um, Gord, be, before I wrap up though, I do want to actually circle back to something that I I, I found interesting, and I want to ask a very spe- uh, specific question about it. You talked about like a mixed fleet, and you're basically trying to find. I'll paraphrase. You're trying to find where different lubricants can overlap enough that you can use. You're not using ten different uh, types. You're trying to minimize it as much as you right. can. Does that change based on maybe their maintenance schedule? You know, their capacity to be able to do it. Um, even their, you know, uh, like staff shortages are a very real thing uh, right now. Skilled labor. So does all that come into play when making that recommendation or is the recommendation based solely on what is best for the equipment in that environment? That's a really good question. And <clears throat> one of the things that we we look at is first and foremost is we look at the OEM recommendations. Ultimately, they built the unit. Mm. They know what they want in it. They've got smart people and and they work with our research guys to develop those recommendations and specifications for a lot of that equipment. So the first thing we do is we look at what does the OEM want in that piece of equipment. Two, our rule number one for us is we always wanna try and keep the warranty in place. Now, Petro Canada has its own warranty that we put in place that if Ron or I make a recommendation, we will warranty that recommendation against failure. But at the end of the day, we want to keep the OEM warranty in place. So that becomes another part of the picture is you, you will quite often have the customer want one lubricant for an application because the unit's under warranty. And as soon as it's out of warranty, then they'll consolidate it to something else. They know it's not going to work as good or as long, mm. but they're able to reduce that skew and get a reduced inventory into the warehouse, which is something they want. And it's funny you hit on it because that's um, it's becoming more and more commonplace to have these things brought up to us is there's a shortage of service base and a shortage yeah. of the trades doing the work. And they now will do oil changes at longer intervals or calendar based because they just don't have the people or the space to do the work anymore. Right. Um, you know, fleets are getting bigger, but they're not building bigger shops on right. the mine site. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the trades, there's a lot of trades right now that there's not a lot of people going into the trades. I mean, if, if you wanted to be a heavy duty mechanic right now or a millwright, you could probably write your own ticket, you know? So those things all become part and parcel of the consideration, but back to the collaborative effort is quite often we'll sit down with a customer and say, you know, what's really important to you? What is the end goal here? Is it to reduce SKUs? Is what, what, what at the end of the day, do you want this experience and, and application to look like? And then we'll try and tailor that as best we can. And, and quite honestly, you know what, I've been in the business long enough. So is Ronnie that if we don't have the answer, it's okay to say, you know what, that can't be done. And right. sometimes that happens. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's, yeah, that you, you're just touching on, on something that is, um, and, and I wish we could, you know, at, at some point we need to do one of these episodes where we just look at all these different case studies, things that can be done, things that can't be done. It'll take a lot of planning, but I think it could actually offer a lot of value just setting up these scenarios. Of course, you'd probably also have to get a whole bunch of approval from all the mining <laughs> operators to do something like that. Um, but Thank you both for coming on the show. It's, you know, PetroCanada Lubricants has been such a big supporter of the show now for, for several years. Um, you know, working with Julie and Sharon and the team, um, it's been a ton of fun. So thank you for coming back on. And uh, hopefully in the new year in 2024, we'll do it again. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Ron. Okay, and thank you everybody for watching. Um, we will have links uh, to some of the, the the services that Petrocanda Lubricants offers um, in the description below. So make sure to go check that out. We'll have you know a link to their LinkedIn so you can follow them, or if you're watching on LinkedIn, there'll just be a tag you can follow them on. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you get as episodes as we expand more and more as companies come back. We just get to go deeper and deeper into topics. So make sure to subscribe to our YouTube. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for the support. We will see you on the next episode of The Crownsman Show.